John 4, verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, although Jesus himself didn't baptize, but only his disciples did, he left Judea, which is southern Israel, and departed again for Galilee, which is uh, extreme northern Israel. And I want you to underline the sentence, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, underline the sentence, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Circle sixth hour, and in your Bible, right, right next to it, noon. So <clears throat> by Jewish reckoning, this is uh, noon. And so it's, high, it's the heat of the day. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? A woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, underline the sentence, If you knew the gift, circle gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never, circle never, be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him, circle become in him, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty anymore or have to come here to this well to draw water. And he said to her, Go, circle go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. So go true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we as Jews worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here, circle is now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, circle spirit, and in truth, circle truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled, circle marveled, that he was talking to a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, circle left her water jar, and went away into town and said to the people, come, circle come, come see this man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to Jesus. Have you ever been thirsty? I'm not talking for a date. I'm talking about like actually physically thirsty. I can remember... I was invited, me and a bunch of other pastors were invited by a company who uh, invited us to come camping. So where are my campers at? Who likes to be down in the dirt? I'm not talking, I'm talking camping, camping, like, like pitch a tent, get in the dirt. Oh, now the hands go, oh no, I, that, oh, that's what you mean by camping. No, I'm talking real camping, like man camping, like put a, put a stake in the ground or sleep in the dirt on a mat. Where are those people, where are my, where are my campers? Dude, literally like an almost, okay. So like six guys in here, okay? And, and so there's a, a smitter smattering of people. The other services were a little more adventurous, I guess. As services get later, they're like, ah, I just want to stay home. Okay, where are my glampers? 
There we go. The people that, people that drive an RV to a place and call it camping. They got indoor plumbing. They got, you know, their waterbed in the desert or whatever. Okay. So this was like real camping. Myself and a, a group of other pastors, we went out to the middle of Joshua Tree, out to the middle of nowhere land. And this company took us out there. Um, and so we're sleeping literally on the desert floor on a mat um, with a fire, we huddled around this fire so we didn't freeze that night and hopefully nobody chewed on our head uh, in the middle of the evening like a bear or something or whatever, whatever's out there. So we all huddled around this fire and about into day three, we took a long hike together. So we all went for this hike way out into no, no man's land of Joshua Tree. And it was, it was late spring, early summer. So it had started to get really hot during the day, middle of the day. And we went way out into the middle of this place and I had brought water with me, but I had realized up until that point for the, la- for the previous couple days of all the things we did, I was already dehydrated. I could feel it. But we went on this long hike, and I realized that the backside of this hike, when you start to turn around, if you've ever been dehydrated, you start to get lightheaded, and it starts to, you feel that like buzzy feeling because your body's starting to shut down. Your, your, your body's starting to realize, uh, we got to get some water up in here. And if we don't get water soon, I'm going to have to shut down your extremities to keep your uh, interior organs lubricated so you stay alive. So it's God's mercy that he starts shutting things down to pull back to your vitals. And I started to realize that. I started to realize, dude, I'm uh, like, I could die here in the next few hours if I don't get water. Like it was at that point. So I drank everything I had and drank some of other people's uh, water and uh, they died, but I made it back (laughs) alive. So thank you to wherever you are. out in the desert. No, so we all made it back. But it, but it was interesting to me that my body, if, so if you, if you know your biology, you're almost all water. You're almost, even your lungs that breathes air is made up of water. It's really bizarre. Uh, our earth, which is the only one we can find in the universe at this point, is so unique that it has an atmosphere and liquid water so that it supports organisms like us, creatures like us that need li- liquid water. So it's a miracle of God that he created the earth the way he did and he created your body the way he did. So your body lets you know things are bad. We need water. Let's get water right now. As bad as physical dehydration can be, because you can die, there is a worse dehydration. And that's when your soul doesn't know God. When your soul, that's your, your body's built for water and your soul is built for God. And many of us, even as we sit here right now, our souls feel far from God. We feel like, I feel dysfunctional. I feel anxious. I feel like I, I, I'm not connected with God. And if there is a God, I, I feel far from him. And there's not, it's bad enough that you'd feel physically dehydrated, but nothing is worse than feeling so, like spiritually dehydrated, like away from God. Because the thing is, I can go get water and fix that dehydration, but where do I take my soul? And Jesus is going to interact here with a woman who's literally, her life is is just broken inside. It's dehydrated. It's dead. And she doesn't know how to fix it. But Jesus is going to help her. And I hope this helps you this morning and me as we seek God. If you got your notes, pull them out. They should be in your bulletin. Uh, the bulletin that you got as you walked into campus. If you're watching online, at the top of the comment section on Facebook, is a link. And click on that link on Facebook and uh, my notes will drop down. And number one is this. The journey of Jesus is disrupted. The journey of Jesus is disrupted. You know, what's interesting is that Jesus had a plan to go with his disciples through Samaria. We're going to talk about what that means in a second. But there came a point where his plan got disrupted because he was exhausted from walking. Like Jesus, the son of God, his body started to break down, which is surprising to us because many of us think if God is, if Jesus is God eternal and he has God powers, why in the world is he sitting beside this well thirsty? Well, let's take a look at it. Here's some background. The journey of Jesus is disrupted. He, He wants to go through Samaria, but he starts to become dehydrated and he has to sit by this well. I want, to, I want to give you a background into who the Samaritans are and why this story is important. If you were reading this story 2,000 years ago, you would have been shocked. It would have literally been shocking 
to see this story, John chapter four in scripture. And there's a reason John put this particular story in there. And it's not just because Jesus uh, talked to a woman in a nice way. There was a, there's a reality here that you and I, we miss in our, with our modern eyes. So I want to talk about who the Samaritans are so you have an idea. After the nation of Israel split into two after Solomon's reign, so everybody pay attention, look at me. Jesus, 2,000 years ago from our time. A 1,000 years before Jesus, King David. Ready? King David has a son named Solomon. Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs in your Bible. That guy. This guy right here, Solomon. By the end of his rule, it's so dysfunctional. When he dies, there's nobody to really take the rule and his sons fight over and they break the kingdom in two. That means there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom that don't get along. Eventually, Assyria, the the massive empire of Assyria, marches into Israel and captures the northern kingdom. They haul off a bunch of people back to Assyria and they send Assyrians into the northern kingdom to settle it. During that time, they intermarry and the children they have are known as a half-breed of Jew and Assyrian called Samaritans. Because they're a half-breed, according to the southern, the pure southern Jewish people, they hate them in the north and the northern people hate them in the south. So there's massive cultural prejudice going on in this story. After the nation of Israel split into two after Solomon's reign, the Assyrians invaded the north in 722 BC. They exiled most of the Jews to Assyria and sent Assyrians to rule the land. As they intermarried with the Jews, their half-breed children called Samaritans were hated by southern kingdom Jews. As Jerusalem and the temple was in the south, which is where the Jews worshiped, the Samaritans were rejected from worshiping there So they made a place of worship up north at Mount Gerizim. So I want to lay this out. Ready? Here's our first principle. Pay attention. The gospel fixes cultural prejudice. The gospel fixes cultural prejudice. We live in a culture right now of animosity. We're we're dredging up stuff, um, you know, of, of 30, 40, 50 years ago right now. So we've gone backwards in a sense of like our culture. Now we care about what people's skin color look like. We try to work our way away from that. Like, you know, judge a man by the content of his character, not the color of his skin. Now we're judging everybody by how they look again, which is just super dysfunctional. But now we're in a, we're in a culture that screams the R word all the time. And it's racism. Hey, that's racist. That's racism. People lose their jobs because, you know, they've tweeted something or said something racist or whatever. But here's the problem when you use that word without, without a... a a biblical definition, definitely, but even a a biological definition is that we're all one race. We are the human race and we're all equal. Why? Because we're built by God. We're not, we're not a bunch of separate races. And if you think that's true, if you're like, no, we're a bunch of separate races, a black race, there's a white race, there's a, you know, people from Hemet, they're their own race. Like everybody's their own race. Let me, let me, let me help you. Let me help you. Not only is that biologically incorrect, it's, it's literally there, there isn't a line where all of a sudden a black person becomes white or a white person becomes black or all of a sudden you become Hispanic. There's no line biologically or even culturally. So understand this. We're all different shades of skin tone, but the thing that makes us valuable isn't our skin tone or our socioeconomic status. The thing that makes us valuable is that we're built by God. So we should all love each other regardless of what we see on the outside It's only the wickedness of the human heart that makes us prejudice against somebody else. And we teach that to our children. Prejudice is taught, not natural. Kids grow up going, I really don't care what you look like. Let's let's chew on that toy or whatever together. Like, (laughs) it couldn't care less. But children are taught that over time. Hey, don't trust the white people. Hey, black, don't hang out with the black people. Hey, we don't hang out with Hispanics. Hey, the Asians are this way. Hey, blah, blah, blah. And so children are taught that and they go, oh, uh, okay rather than going, you're built special by God. He's built special by God. We might not always get along and always agree. And we might have some things we got to work on socially, but the answer isn't let's separate and hate each other. The answer is let's find our common ground in God and work towards resolution because we're all loved by God. So we should all love one another. Listen, ready? It's totally dysfunctional how we, how we dialogue about, about our, 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 uh, our, our issues online. Twitter never fixes anything. It just starts fires. So here's the thing. Always deal with it from a biblical standpoint. And Jesus right here walks into the messiest 
prejudicial, if you want to call it racist, because that's a common word we use now, situation you could ever imagine. Everything that we deal with in our culture that's like, wow, this is really a deal because, you know, the uh, American history has a past and blah, 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 which is true. But this issue was more extreme than anything we've ever dealt with in America. That's why it's so surprising. The disciples are like, scripture says they were astonished that he was talking to a Samaritan because in this day, the Southern kingdom Jews, the pure Jews, hated the Samaritans, the half-breeds, and they, they would go around their nation. They walked on the other side of the Jordan River to get to Galilee, which is where the, where the uh, lake was. So there was extreme northern Galilee was settled by pure uh, Jewish people. The middle's all Samaritans. And then the lower uh, area where Jerusalem is, is the purebred Jews. So the problem is that if you wanted, if you're a purebred Jew like Jesus is, you had to go through Samaria, which almost nobody did, or you went around by the Mediterranean Sea, or you went over the Jordan River and went around. Jesus goes, hey, guess what, guys? He tells all his boys, hey, we're going through Samaria. Are you insane? No, we're going to go through Samaria. And we're going to take a look at one of the most beautiful pictures of prejudicial reconciliation and the way forward for a person and a culture if you struggle in this area. It's the gospel. It's the good news that God loves all people and wants them to be transformed regardless of what you look like, regardless of where you come from. It's the beauty of the gospel of God. Ready? By Jesus' day, three routes went north to Galilee. Two went around Samaria and one went through the middle. Jesus took the rarely traveled one and had to stop from thirst at a well near Sychar. Without anything to draw water, he waited for help. Even the limitless God had limits as a man. Check this out. So I would expect myself to get thirsty. I don't expect Jesus to get thirsty. You want to know why? Because I'm just a loser regular guy. Jesus is God in the flesh. So here's what I expect out of Jesus. If I'm Jesus, I walk up to the well and go, actually, I don't ever get thirsty. I just, my body just continually makes water all the time. I don't even know why I'm clout, snapping my fingers. But my, I never get thirsty. I never get sick. I always have great relationships with everybody. Nobody's ever mad at me. It's amazing. You want to know why? Because I'm God. My life is cake. It's amazing. I never have financial problems. I always get along with everybody. It's ama- I love being God. This is an amazing day for me as Jesus. This is an amazing day. You know what I love about scripture though? It teaches that Jesus was not God walking around in the facade of a man. It teaches that Jesus became a real man. Here's what that means theologically. Listen to me. Because this this will help you maybe appreciate Jesus more. Jesus set aside all of his God-like qualities, not letting go of him being God as God, as, as nature, but he let go of all of his God, the exercise of all of his gifts, so to speak, as God. All knowing, I know, you know, I know the future, I can do anything, I can make, I have, I have the power to do anything. All the, all the God qualities, he sets those aside and it says the Holy Spirit dwelled inside of him in the same way that the Holy Spirit can dwell inside of us. And all the miracles Jesus did, all the making of uh, things out of nowhere, bread, fish, he, see, he knows people's thoughts. The Holy Spirit is doing that in Jesus. So what that means is this. Jesus wasn't some divine robot with some human skin walking around. He was actually me and you. But the difference between us and him is that Jesus was without sin. Jesus never sinned. He always said no to sin. He was physically able to sin. He had the ability to sin as a, as a human man, but every single time he was tempted said no, which, which made him sinless, but still human. And the picture is beautiful in this picture where he sits down at a well and he doesn't have anything to get water with. You would think Jesus would do this. Bucket, ding. <laughs> Rope, ding. Actually, I'm not even gonna do it myself. Bucket, get me some water. Pour it in my mouth. You think Jesus as God would just go, I don't get thirsty. And if I do get thirsty, I'm just going to make everything work for me. But he doesn't. He has to wait for a woman to walk up and go, I got a bucket. I love the humanity of this picture. In other words, the point is Jesus is not like detached from the real world. So the beauty of this is that when you know Jesus, you know, he knows your life. He knows financial stress. He got the flu. Things happen in his life that 
he wouldn't have wanted to happen. He didn't plan for like this event. He got exhausted. He sat down at a well and his, his boys leave him and they go into town to get food. He goes, man, I'd really like something to drink. And all of a sudden here comes a woman in the middle of the day. Number one, the journey of Jesus is disrupted by his humanness. He had planned to just go through Samaria. I'm not going to make it, guys. I got to sit down for a second, which is amazing when you think about Jesus being God. Number two, the disruption of Jesus. So Jesus' plans are disrupted by getting tired. The disruption of Jesus becomes the woman's disruption. So now let's talk about why the woman was out there in the middle of the day by herself, which doesn't make any sense. Let me help you with this. Ready? You want to know one of the ways you know you're, you live in a safe area? One of the surest ways you know you're in, you live in a safe area is when women jog by themselves. <laughs> True story. Sociologically, if you live in an area where women don't go out by themselves or, or don't jog by themselves or are out by themselves late at night or whatever, uh, they're, they're alone, you, you, live in a, you live in a safe, great area. Like, I, I was from, I'm from Pomona. Anybody been through Pomona lately? <laughs> Do you better wear a flak jacket and be packing something rolling through there, Right? <laughs> So there's some sketchy areas of Pomona. I, did, I, was, I was a pastor in Pomona for years. I was like pasty white me. And so when I moved to Temecula, I thought I like moved to Disneyland. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm driving my car. All hours of the night, women are out jogging by themselves. Uh, you know, women walking with their little shih tzus or whatever on the, you know, walking. they're not walking with pit bulls and, you know, rolling through the hood or whatever. Any of you guys that don't know what shih tzus are, they're like the little dogs that shouldn't be dogs. They're like basically like cats. You know, like, you know, she picks it up off the ground. She's like, oh, yeah, look, you got a little poopy or whatever. She puts it back in her purse and they go, you know, around the day or whatever. But when I came to Temecula, I was amazed because I'm like, one of the ways you know you live in a safe area is when women don't worry about being assaulted. And they can go out by themselves. Uh, it, it, seriously. Because I grew up in places where, like, you, wow, you would never see a woman by themselves, much less late at night, ever. Unless they were walking the street for a reason. And here you see a woman in the middle of the day walking by herself. And that's interesting because in, in, in ancient times, same thing with modern times, there was, there was reasons that women would walk by themselves. And it's possibly this right here. In the heat of the day around noon, Jesus meets a woman from Sychar who came out alone to draw water. As most women got water early in the morning, because when it's cooler and to uh, take care of their families, make food and whatever else, and traveled in groups for safety so they didn't get assaulted, and companionship so they had other women to talk to, her being alone probably meant she was rejected by her culture or her town because of her sexual past. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the deep water here for a second. Everybody look at me with your eyes. <laughs> Ready? I'm not joking when I say that. Ready? Sexual sin has a price. Sexual sin has a price, and it's a steep price to pay. And what do I mean by that? I mean this. You feel guilt. You feel regret. You destroy relationships. You make decisions that break things that you wish you wouldn't have broken. So sexual sin has a price. Our culture tells us, hey, don't worry about your sexual sin, man. Just do whatever you want. As long as you're happy, be cool. But we realize when we do go down that road, we just go, I don't feel cool. I don't feel great. I feel bad. I have regret. There are things in my life I wish I had never done. And many of those things come out of sexual choices that we make. And that's from God. God gives us the beauty and the gift of sexuality, which is a strong driver. It drives men and women together, which is beautiful. Sex inside of the design of how God made it in marriage is, is, is not only how we procreate and create our families and the, the beauty of a family, but the beauty of sexual intercourse is just is awesome. It's a design of God. So that drive to, 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 to be so close to a person is a gift of God. However, when we don't use it according to God's gift, it becomes a source of regret and dysfunction and brokenness. The issue is this. We don't know where to take our brokenness because it's a spiritual thing. Sexual sin is a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. Because you can move beyond the sexual encounter physically and just move on with your life. But there's things inside that you go, do I just feel just broken inside? And Jesus meets a woman like that here. And here's one thing I want to point out, and this is something you're not going to hear on Twitter or any little talk show that you listen to or whatever. Ready? Sexual sin has a price, and that price is most often paid most dearly by women. Ready? I'm going to take you through 
like real biology and real sociology. Listen to me. God has made men and women different. Let's start there. Okay? Listen, ready, be care, listen to me. You can't switch your sexes. You can get surgery. You can take hormone pills to change your appearance. But literally every one of your cells genetically tells you if you're a man or a woman, which is why at a crime scene, they can often take cell or blood samples and know it's a white male or blah, 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 or whatever. Because literally your cells tell you if you're a man or a woman. So you can try to change if mentally you think, gosh, I feel like a, ma- a woman trapped in a man's body or whatever. And you can try to change morphology to, to be a certain thing. But understand, God built you a certain way, literally chemically and biology. Here's what that means. If I'm a woman, my body is designed a certain way. If I'm a man, my body's designed a certain way. Men are primarily designed to work hard. They're built to work hard. They work physically. They're bigger, faster, stronger as far as the two sexes go. And they are primarily designed by God to work hard their whole lives to support their home. That's God's design. The other design is ladies are primarily designed heavy relationships. They can go do work. They can do whatever they want to do. But ideally, they're designed to take care of family because that's how we get families. Here's the thing. Men and women are drawn together strongly by a sexual desire for sexual bond. When that happens... Many times, pregnancy happens. Here's the issue. For almost all of history, women have had to deal with the pregnancy because men are like, they have sexual contact and they go back to work. Women, they have sexual contact and if pregnancy comes out of that, here's the problem, ready? It's not a problem, here's the challenge. Women's bodies involuntarily start making a baby. So the woman goes, I don't want a baby, but the body goes, we're making one now because we had sexual contact, and the body involuntarily goes, we're building this kid. But if the woman doesn't want that, now she's stuck, because the man can go about his business. But the woman now has to deal with the after repercussions of that sexual contact. And a baby's coming. So our culture deals with it like this. We call it abortion. We call it protecting a woman's rights of her body. But here's the problem, is a whole other body's being built inside of her. It's literally genetically a different person. Her body's built by God to take care of that person until it's born. And even after it's born, the woman's body is designed to take care of that baby after it's born. So here, our culture says this. We want women to be as free as men to make sexual choices so they should be able to kill their children legally. So when we talk about controlling bodies, it's not actually about bodies. It's about, I want to be, women want to be as free as men to go about their lives and say, I don't really want, I'm not ready for a kid. I don't want this kid. It's going to get in the way of my job or my blah, 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 whatever. And they're able to get rid of their children legally. But that doesn't change the fact that inside, those of us that have dealt with abortions in our lives, we just, we think about that often. We go, man, there'd be a whole other person here if I hadn't made that choice for school or for my work or, you know, I got too many kids already or whatever. And it just tears us apart inside, even though it's legal We know the moral side just tears us to shreds because of choices that we made. And as dads, there's a reason if you're a, if you're a daughter growing up with a dad, your dad's psycho about who you date. Oh no, you're not dating that tool bag. (laughs) You're not coming into my house. And you go, dad, will you let Johnny, my brother date whoever? Well, I don't really care about that. Johnny's going to go off and fly the coop someday, but I know I'm going to have to deal with everything that you're going to do as far as taking a husband. So listen, ready? There's a reason men get psycho about their daughters and it's different. You want to know why that is? Because many times women have such a a deep desire for strong, deep relationships, they'll give up their body to get a relationship and they will have to deal with the repercussions of giving up their body. And dads go, I'm going to put a stop to this mess before it even starts. We're going to fix this mess on the front end. Because here's the thing. You know who keeps men in line? Not women. You know who keeps men in line? Other men, you're going to get your head broke, son. Oh, okay. I'm not dating your daughter. (laughs) So understand there's a difference between men and women. It's beautiful. The difference between men, masculine and femininity is a beautiful gift of God. But when we start going outside of God's boundaries, that's when we get broken inside. And this woman is broken. And we're going to see how Jesus lovingly walks her through the issues that she has in her life. It's beautiful but I want to lay that foundation. There's a bunch of cultural hatred and she's got a bunch of brokenness in her own life. This is one of the messiest stories in the whole Bible. And it's oftentimes it's missed because we don't, we don't dig into the cultural moment. 
Ready? As Jews believed that Samaritans were equal to dogs and didn't associate with them, when Jesus speaks respectfully to her first, she is surprised. Also, men in that day, 2,000 years ago, did not openly associate with women in public unless it was their own wife. Rabbis, as a, as a teacher, Jesus was called a Jewish rabbi, which means he was a Jewish teacher. Rabbis, even less so, especially to a woman of a bad sexual reputation. So I put a little, uh, like a, a little addition problem in here, those of you guys that love math. Jewish plus man plus rabbi plus Samaritan plus woman plus loose morals plus sharing water plus out in public equals bad news. This whole story is bad news. It's like if you were to see a picture of me on Twitter or whatever, like, and I'm in Vegas and I'm rolling through a casino and like a scantily clad woman is offering me a drink and somebody takes a picture of that, you go, <gasps> do you know that's probably a hooker? Do you know, pastor, you should not be walking through the, the, the velvet room or whatever in Vegas. What are you doing? Like, that's the shock of this picture. That's why the disciples go back. The scripture says they were astonished. Like, the word literally means, like, they were shocked. It's like if they took a picture of Jesus, you know, walking down, like, the red light district in Amsterdam or something. They go, what are, you, what are you doing out at this late night, Jesus? Like, don't you know who's, like, out here? But Jesus, in this loving moment, goes after a woman who's broken. A woman he shouldn't be associating with literally at any level. He's the man. Like he's the man, man. And he goes to the woman at the bottom, literally the bottom of the social scale because of his great love for humanity. Human disruption can, can lead to divine encounters. Human disruption, when our plans get wrecked, oftentimes that's when God inserts people into our life that we are to reach out with the gospel. Let me tell you how it works, ready? You run out of bread. You're like, oh, I run out of bread. I should get Instacart to come deliver me bread. Oh, <sighs> I hate it. There's nobody that can deliver me bread. What's wrong with society? I'm gonna have to get my own bread. And you get in your car and you drive 1.3 miles to Walmart. You're like, I can't believe I gotta take time out to get bread. You're like so disgusted that your plans got wrecked to watch Netflix. You had to take time out to go get your own bread. And you walk into Walmart and you know what? There are people that God put in your path because he allowed disruption in your life that you are to interact with the gospel. And you know, one of the worst places to work is retail. If you've ever worked retail, like I, who's worked retail? Who's had the punishment to work in retail? Okay, good. You want to know my encouragement to you? Is love on those people checking out your stuff. They wear a name tag, go, John, how's your day going today? And he's going to be amazed. Like, how'd you know my name? Oh, there it is. Because <laughs> nobody interacts with me. They just expect me to check out their Bubblicious or their orange juice or whatever. You say, hey, John, how are things going today? That's going all right. How are things going with you? And I always say this, oh man, it's going glorious. And they're like shocked. They're like, dude, how, I wish my day was going glorious. And many times I'll have, an, I'll have a moment to just go, I appreciate you, John. Hey, thanks for doing a good job here. I appreciate you. You can be sometimes the only good thing that happens to somebody's whole day. And go, hey, I just want to let you know. And they'll, they'll, be, they'll ask me like, hey, why is your day going so good? Oh man, Jesus is just doing some good things in my life. And I just want to say, I, I just want to encourage you, man. And it's, Literally those three sentences, I brought the gospel into that man's life. And though it's a disruption for me to have to go get my own bread, <laughs> I have the opportunity to go, my disruption can be an opportunity for the gospel. Because the only reason we get mad that our tire blows out in the 15 and, and, and God might want us to interact with the AAA driver, we're just mad about the tire screwing up our plans. But God screwed up our plans so that we can insert the gospel into somebody else's life and a guy we'd never meet. We're all, the only reason we get mad is because we're so selfish. We can't see God moving in our disruption. And Jesus right here goes, I'm going to reach out to this woman because God loves her. She's totally different than me, but God loves her. She needs the gospel. Lastly, the reject becomes accepted. The reject in society, her, becomes accepted by God. Jesus finds common ground in her desire to know God, then dissects her spiritual condition. He uses the well to illustrate that just as living water, um, just as the living water in the well flows from a limitless underground stream, spiritual water can flow in the heart from a limitless eternal God. The woman was theologically confused, guilt-ridden, and sin-burdened. And in a touching moment, though, Jesus lovingly confronts her sexual sin. He doesn't 
He doesn't wash over it. He confronts it. Hey, you've had five husbands and you gave up on marriage because now you're living with a dude. So let me make this clear again. Let me say it again. Marriage is not the same as living together. Living together is not practice for marriage. If you're living together and you're going, we're just trying before we buy. Don't do that. Don't, don't live in sexual sin expecting your marriage to be awesome. Live, live the way God wants you to live. If you're living together, get out of that situation. Literally leave that situation. But it's financially blo- I don't care. God can give you more money. God wants you to live pure. Living together is not the same as marriage. Having sex outside of marriage is not the same as sex in marriage. You will break your own self. Your own soul will thirst for God because God is against the way all of us live when we go outside of God's design. So God, so Jesus confronts her. Hey, you don't have a husband. You're living with a guy and that's un- it's unacceptable. But then he loves on her and goes, here's the way forward. Here's repentance. Here's forgiveness. Here's grace. Here's love. Hearing this message of grace and forgiveness, she runs to tell others about it. The disruption of God's grace can turn the lost people into the found. So I love this. Ready? I'm done. Let's look at me. I love this last little piece. She goes, you must be a prophet. Correct. I am. Because I just knew your whole sexual history and I just called you out right in public on this well. And she goes, no way. Like God can still like, I'm still loved by God. Like you're a Jewish rabbi stud guy, dude. And you still are okay with me kind of reputation of a prostitute, like low level, nothing woman. You like, you're, God is, can still be okay with me. Yep. Come, come get living water to feed your soul. She runs back into town. She goes into Sychar. Hey, there's a guy out there. Well, he knows everything I ever did. And people in Sychar are like, everybody here knows everything you ever did too. <laughs> so, but, so that's not surprising. I'll tell you what's surprising though, is some Jew from Jerusalem actually even talked to you. Like that's the shocker. And they all run out to Jesus. That's awesome. You know what? That well still exists. When we go to Israel, (laughs) if you're like, why is everybody moaning? I just got here because I've been saying that for seven years. (laughs) But when we go to Israel, the well is still still there. Here's a picture of it. Here's, here, do 1800s. So this was the picture of it in 1800, in 1890, before anybody built anything over it, that literally that same well of, of John 4, where he met the woman, he sat on a rock next to a hole in the ground. And that story took place literally right there. Imagine Jesus sitting there talking to a woman, probably similarly dressed to the women in this picture, because this is ancient Palestine, or you know, 1800s Palestine, which is the same as they've always dressed. And here it is today. And you know what the thing was? Interestingly, she says this, hey, the well is deep. That was 2,000 years ago. And you know what people started to do when tourists went there because they wanted to, to interact with this story? They started throwing rocks in it to see how deep it was. And they started to fill the well up. And so they had to put a like cathedral over it so people would quit filling the well up. But you can go literally draw water. The, the stream that Jesus talks about, like, hey, you're going to get thirsty from this well, it still flows to this day. You can still pull water out of the same well that John 4 uh, story took place in. And that's what she's doing right there. That's the same spot. So Jesus met that woman there. And uh, this whole story took place right around that hole in the ground. And uh, we will go there at some time in the next 28 years. So 